But everyone else says they can hear you, so I, I think it's a confusion. Who can't hear? Angelina. Oh, that's cute. She says her son says you look like science. You look like science. What science? The science guy. <laughs> <laughs> that is cute. Hey, I went through Dr. Uh, Darcy's morning. She's like, oh, are you a doctor? <laughs> She's like all oh, like enthralled. I'm like, no, I'm a stenographer. It's better. It's really <laughs> better. It's better than a doctor. So. Um, PRF being too high is going to make it all squishy, right? So we got to make sure we do that. What's another thing that could be wrong? Your dog is working. What if, what if we're like this? Incorrectly. Oh, your angle. Your yeah, what if we're at 90 degrees? That could be a reason we're not getting anything. So angle. I know, I'm making a bunch of you know, lock up here. I actually have a stupid question. Um, I think I know the answer, but I just want to make sure because I was talking to someone in um, the class before us about Doppler and I suggested that you like because it was she was standing my carotid and it was like black streaking in between it almost looked like there was like a blockage but it was so flowy that like it wasn't a mask and I said something about the angle but she said that that doesn't always apply but doesn't the angle literally always apply common sense when you're doing it if I'm over here how am I going to pick up well I mean I know but she's like an older class, like, so I was I like am I where, where was it here this is a class ahead of us. I don't want to like throw her into the bus, but we're out on the clinicals and she's back. probably gone anyways. She's not. No, we were just here <laughs> scanning because she had to turn in something for Miss Baker, so she was doing my kidney. Um, yeah, and we. I just wanted. Was she down for your kidney? It was my brother. Because she used to show me like the vertebrae and stuff like that that we do yeah. coming up. And I was like talking to her about it, and I didn't know. I was like, you know, I don't want to argue with someone who's ahead of me, but I was like pretty sure you always. Yeah. Well, the, the, the thing of it is, if she's doing the vertebral and we don't care what the velocity is, as long as you're not at 90 and you can pick it up, you can show whether it's integrated or not. It was that, for the that, color that, flow. It was for the color flow because, like, on my, it was just like mid or prox, like wow. regular aorta, and it had like black, like flow coming through when yeah, it wasn't yeah. filling. So that yeah. was um, the color flow. I thought you meant like on the spectrum, the required mm -hmm. marks. I was like, how could she even say that? Yeah, right. of course it matters. That's what I thought, but like I said, she's yeah. older. Not older, but like I she had. Yeah. See how quickly people forget or don't care that fast. I don't know. It's just like I don't That's know. That's not cool. Yeah. No. Well, you you can you know you don't have to take my word for anything. Just try it. You'll see whether it works or not. Yep. You know, it's it's kind of like you can prove it. It's, it's common sense once you prove it to yourself. All right, so what is another thing you do? So he said, lower the wall filter, lower the PRF, make sure your angle is at least 60, but we're zero if you can, why not, right? We're not worried about the actual number so much as actually seeing an ASD. We're not looking to see if it's 5, 10, or 12. We're just looking to see is there an A wave, an S, and a D proportional. What about if your box is not steered the correct direction? You that would be the same. Flow. Yeah, that would be the same as the angle. Angle for the box or angle for your Doppler beam. What about with abdominal vessels, especially Doppler? What do we want? Lower the frequency? Yeah, good girl. You want to lower the operating frequency, the one you're actually scanning with. So if you're scanning at a three and a half or a five, drop it down to a two and a half. Sometimes we forget to do that, but we got to remember, well, abdominal Doppler, the reason we're probably struggling is it attenuates so fast. It's already tough enough to get through the liver and all that. By the time you get to those little vessels, the color flow is just, it just, you know, can't send out enough packets or even the Doppler if you don't lower the frequency. Mm -hmm. It's going to attenuate. So lower the operating frequency. Anything else? You said there's at least five. Usually there's six or seven or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, I'm struggling myself. Does it have anything to do with the game, the Doppler thing? The Doppler, yeah, a gain, of course, yeah. If the Doppler gain is too low, we have to turn it up. So, yeah, Doppler gain. There's some other thing I was thinking of, though. It wasn't the Doppler gain, but that's absolutely one. Um, sometimes, and I know this is weird, but we kind of talked about this, too, especially with color. If you're trying to pick up color sensitivity, and this is full of grayscale because it's too bright, the grayscale overrides the filling in of the, of the color. 
So that's more important to make sure your TGCs clean out the lumen of the vessel. The smaller ones, not so much. But we want to make sure that that gate is covering you know, most of that vessel. Would that be another one, the gate size? Well, the gate size of the small vessel is probably going to be a good size. Even if you have the smallest, only to make it, if you make it bigger, I don't think it's going to make much of a difference. Well, those are bigger. And these, yeah, with those vessels, yeah. These yeah, are the all the increases, the sensitivity. sensitivity, the ability yeah. to pick up a signal when there really is a signal. That's what we mean by sensitivity. What do we do? Now, on your quiz, guys, on Friday, you are going to also have about four or five pictures. What's wrong with it? How do you fix it? Like stuff like this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You're going to tell me, oh, the gate's too big. That's why it looks like that. Are the gate's? No, are the angles 90 degrees? Like Something's that. not going to be because your registry is going to probably have like 10 questions about that on your, yeah, yeah, yeah. your um, physics registry. I don't know, but that's a good place to start, right? Start with probably these will fix it. These three, the top three are going to be these. Well, with abdominal imaging, probably the top four for the most part. Are they you know, available after class to go over that? Um, Cause also yeah. we were we were going over these last night, and all like I don't know what happened. Like we, I feel like we were gone for like a week, and my brain just like went dead. Because <laughs> you didn't think of anything. To no, 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 well, we, we did. Couple, but we like, know we could have gotten more. Like we were we were just asking like this stupid so questions. Much. Like how do we know if it's plug flow looking at these? Like if that's like well we don't ever label anything as plug flow. Okay, so we don't know. So we were right about that. Okay, so like, like, the yeah. other thing. No, no we like, don't label it plug. You don't. Label it parabolic. Okay, um, and then the other thing we were having a brain fart on is um, the blood flow. Like, okay, so looking at the waveform, are you talking we're about the like, <laughs> yeah. Okay, Let's, go ahead. <laughs> looking at the waveform, we're like, does the waveform? I don't even know how to word this. Let me let me try to take this. Word this. Okay, because this was my question, and I think I know we went over this. I just confused yeah. ourselves. So. <laughs> But, okay. So <laughs> when you're gonna you're gonna be like you guys are when you're looking at a wave, yeah. We're trying to figure out because um some of them are about the the volume, like whether mm -hmm. it's continuous volume or not. Right. So we're obviously like this is velocity because that's right. like having to do with PRS, right. but is the volume it going across like yeah. this? So if there's so a there's a gap in time, yes. that's a missing yeah, yes. volume. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. We just weren't sure. We were kind of so going let's say yeah, the waveform looks like this. Coming along like this, little undulating flow pattern. Then there's a stop, and then it starts to pick back up again. That would mean low there's volume. No there's volume. A, yeah, you've so lost. That. Well, it's obvious, right? You've lost yeah. the volume, and it came back. And it's not like you moved or slipped. You slipped off. That would be different. Obviously, right. your fault. But is it them versus you? Is what you're always trying to figure out. And that's where the oh my gosh, there's five things I should be doing comes in, right? Is it me or is it them? Because there's nothing worse than having your wall filter too high and then saying, oh, there's no flow in there. How embarrassing, not only embarrassing, but what a, what a disservice you're doing to your patient who's in there trying to be evaluated, something's wrong, and you just don't know how to operate your machine. And you're saying, yeah, no flow. Or you're sitting there at 90 degrees, oh, no, no, that's got no flow. And the patient's probably listening to this going, oh, my God, you're dying? Like, you're all right. <laughs> and so they say, oh, look at that. Go, What's wrong? Okay, so the blood flow is the entire. The fact that it the volume flow. Flow. all of these have good volume. That's what I'm saying. So okay. But we like, don't comment on that with arteries, because the arteries will like triphasic flow. It will skip. It won't necessarily always be constant. Okay, so arteries. With some we don't care about. Right, it's the veins. It's the veins about their flow. All we care about with veins is is it spontaneous and phasic. Or continuous. Those are the, the words, right? Spontaneous, basic, continuous. Um, those are the three terms that go with veins. Everything else goes with arteries. But plug and parabolic, if it were plug in an artery, it would look literally almost like what a vein would look like, the same velocity. You're not going to really um, Doppler arteries that look like that unless you're doing echoes. When we do echoes and I Doppler like the actual valves, I'll get this kind of flow. They look like this. Are we going to do echoes? No. Oh, we just started thinking, yeah. like, because we were, we were talking about the quiz and we're going over, like, 
you're going to ask us to label this as myth. So then we started thinking, like, okay, how do we know if it's laminar? How do we know if it's plug? Like, how do? Yeah, I don't know how to do that. Yeah, like, again, if you're yeah. doing the heart, you're going to see all laminar. Laminar means it, it goes in in like a parabola. You see high velocities, low velocities. You know that they're all different speeds because you can see that here. You're not going to really deal with plug because you're going to see plug. And like if I were to, to Doppler the aortic valve, it's going to look like this. It's a very different look when you're doing echoes. It looks plug, but it sounds arterial. It's like, shh, shh, shh. It's coming out of there super fast, but we expect a plug situation because all of that left ventricle's blood is moving through that little area and it's all going through there at the same rate. So it has a different sound. So when you drop or if you end up doing echoes, those, those waveforms look different. And then if they have something called regurge, which means it's reversal, it'll look like this big, we call it, we measure the, the, the slope. This is regurgitation. It looks like this jet of regurgitation. So echoes have a different look. Remember another question we came up with. Um, you say to fro flow a lot, and we weren't exactly sure what that meant. We have some ideas. Yeah, to fro is when you'd see in the neck of a pseudoaneurysm. So if they have like a pseudoaneurysm, which is really like a big hematoma, but it's still actively getting flow, the flow goes like this, to and fro, back and forth, to fro. It shares the same time like this. That's when to fro flow. To fro? To. Yeah, she says it all the time. And we're always like, what? <laughs> oh, you what? what? I'm to fro. Ignore what I'm saying. Two fro flow. I thought it was the number two. I'm thinking like two and fro, back and forth kind of thing. Oh. Um, and and you might have heard the term tarvis parvis waveform. Mm -hmm. No. Yep. It just means a monophasic. That's another when an artery's gone bad and you're just getting a little bit. It's a tarvis parvis waveform. It, it's it's Latin for small pulse. Oh, so it's actually a word. Tarvis. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to keep the person's name. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a Latin term. We learned about it in this Small pulse. Did you? Did yeah. I mention it then? Mm -hmm. You probably did. Okay. I try to mention things that might come up that you'll be like, what is that? Mm -hmm. So like two fro flow, tar tarvis parvis. So you, if you were to def define two fro flow, it would be like to and from sharing the same time. Yeah. Okay. To and, yeah. Yep, at the same time. Two fro flow. That would indicate that that's still a pseudoaneurysm. It's still actively swishing blood back and forth from the artery to the hematoma or pseudoaneurysm, as they would refer to it. Okay, so let's let's continue. You're probably going to get all your questions answered as we go through each one. So now the IVC proximal. Now, if you look at this picture here, it's showing that. Proximal is closest to the heart in this case, right? So we're looking at it from a general sonographer's perspective. But even if you didn't know whether that was proximal or distal, the best thing to do is clearly state that the portion of the IVC closest to the heart, and then you call it either proximal or distal, exhibits an ASD. The portion of the IVC further away from the heart has a more phasic flow pattern. So just Basically, state whether you're talking closer to the heart or further away if you're confused with which is proximal and which is distal. Use whichever word you want, but to make sure I know that you know, the only one that's going to have the ASD are only the ones that are close to the heart because that's where the right atrium contracting is going to push blood back out because there's no valves there. Now, when we get to, and this is what I want to talk about next, the distal IVC, there's three different waveforms the distal IVC might have. Now, let's see if you can tell me what they are. In a pretty average, healthy person of average weight, of average stature, of average everything, they're probably going to have, in the distal IVC, a phasic flow pattern. Okay? So again, assuming that in the perfect environment, you'll have phasic. And phasic, by definition, because I might ask you this, define what phasic is. Who could tell me what phasic is by definition to get full credit? Uh, it's going to be worth three points. 
slight velocity change. Slight change in velocity. And? I thought it was pressure is normal and volume is consistent. No? No, well, that would just mean it went on and on. That doesn't define phasic. The definition of phasic is slight changes in velocity and pressure due to respiration. respiration. That's full credit. Because what's causing this undulating pattern, and this, this is going to be, time. I'm sorry, slight, change. slight changes in velocity and pressure due to respiration. And basically what causes this, and I usually don't get into this until we do venous hemodynamics, but we'll just do this anyways. Okay. If this is the IBC and then this is all the way down the common front, all the way down the leg, let's say this is the person's leg right here. This is their butt. This is their abdomen up here. Okay. <laughs> this is their leg and here's their little toes. For blood to return back to the heart, there has to be a pressure gradient. And we're evaluating our patient in the supine position because that way we don't have to factor in gravity or anything like that, right? So basically, let's say it's 100 here, 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. You get it all the way down to zero at the atrium, right? Okay, if we were to calculate out a pressure gradient at any two points, for volume flow to move in this direction, it would have to be lower here than it is here. But one thing that veins have that arteries don't is they have these valves, and numerous amounts of valves, especially the lower extremities, because every time the muscle of the calf contracts, we want blood to stay moving forward. So it'll contract, push a little bit of blood up, and then these valves hold it from going back, especially when you're standing. But when you're supine, they're barely working. So let's say, let's just take this location here, P1 and P2. Any point we want. This one's at 70 and P1 is at 10. What's my pressure gradient? 60. 60. And the flow direction is? Wait, wait. This way. Don't they have to be, 10 have to be P2 and 7? Doesn't matter. Oh. You can pick any two points you want. And you just, just which one ever is higher is going to show you which way you, it goes. The blood's going. Okay. No. Yeah. So I can make this P1, I can make this P1, okay. it doesn't matter. I thought it's, the formula was P1 minus It's the pressure at P2. one point versus oh. the pressure at another point. Gotcha. Okay. Point location one, location two. We could do location three. It's taking two points and taking the difference. And the direction is always high to low. So the direction is this way. Now what happens when you're in the supine position? When the diaphragm, when you take in a breath, what happens with inspiration is your lungs fill with air and it pushes down on the diaphragm. And when it does that, pressure here goes up a little bit. Let's say it goes up to 15. Nothing drastic, but what happened to the pressure gradient with inspiration? It's 55. It's 55. And then with expiration, it goes back to 10. So then it goes back to 60. Well, what do you think makes it look like this? 55, 60, 55, 60, 55, 60, 55. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> so if your patient is standing, can you actually evaluate for phasic flow? What will it look like if they're standing? You're not going to be able to see slight changes. It's going to look more continuous, probably. Yeah. Right? So we don't evaluate them that way. When everything's normal, you have slight changes with respiration because the pushing of the diaphragm puts pressure on your, your pelvic, abdominal pelvic cavity a little bit, just a little bit on the IBC. It kind of pinches it when it pushes down. Every time it pinches it, it just goes up just a tiny bit in pressure, which makes the gradient go down. And then, so you have inspiration, expiration, inspiration, expiration. Little tiny changes in the waveform. So if a patient is holding their breath, it's going to be all one? Well, if they're holding their breath, okay, when you have Valsalva, you have to take a deep breath in and bear down and push, you're making this pressure really high. Let's say it's, it's 
75, if you could do that, if you go really push hard. What should happen if the valve weren't there to stop it, blood would then reverse and go on this side. But if you have good, healthy valves, you'll get nothing. Flow just stops. The valve's holding it. There's absolutely no flow. What if you don't have that push? What if you just hold your breath with no push? If you hold your breath, you're probably going to stop the undulating flow pattern too and maybe a little bit more continuous. Okay. Yeah, so many things that you or your patient are doing can change that waveform. So now that we know what causes the undulating flow pattern in the supine position, and you know the definition, it's slight changes in velocity or pressure, because it's the pressure, the pressure changes the velocity. We graph on a velocity scale, but what's really changing is the pressure. So slight changes in pressure and or velocity due to respiration. Okay, so when we get to next week, you guys will be like, that's the only physics lesson for next week. The rest is sort of just facts. You should understand, hopefully, a little bit better those things. So now let's get back to the other two IVC findings we might have. Okay, we already know that if this is the heart here, this portion here is going to have an ASD. And this one we said in most people is phasic. If everything's pretty normal. What if we get continuous? There's two things that can cause continuous flow in that more distal. Again, if we're general sonographers and we call this prox, and we call this distal as prox. So can it be um, either pregnancy or um, if, if you have an obese patient and it's the fat is compressing? Um, either or. Okay. Yeah. There's this couple of things, right? Or what about you? What if you're pushing oh, too hard? I mean, I'm kind of you could be pushing too hard. Your patient could be overweight. Your patient might be pregnant and hematocrit increases. When the blood's thicker, it tends to be more blended and more continuous. So something's going on, but how easy, how easily we can cause that to look abnormal when it's normal. Now here's another good thing to help you figure out whether it's you or them. I don't know if you guys remember when you had to scan all the way to the distal IVC. It's mm -hmm. almost impossible to see without color. That's a good sign. That means the pressure is low. You can see it. if the IVC is just going, hey, and it's round and circular, we already know pressure is too high. Yeah. If they're lying flat and their IVC is just as round as their aorta, they have elevated central venous pressure. Why is their pressure elevated? We already expect to see that. So just looking at the shape of the vein or just seeing that it's dilated all the way down and big, their pressure is a little high for whatever reason. Now, if they have really, really low pressure, like it's so collapsed that you can't see it unless you put color on and you barely get some, then they have low pressure. There's nothing really wrong, wrong with having arterial. I'm talking about blood pressure being too low other than the fact that you could pass out if it's too low. You're just not getting enough blood where it needs Wait, to go. Did you just say arterial? Yes, arterial. Because okay. systemically it will make your venous pressure low as well. Oh, okay. So low low going volume going out, low returning, low systemically through the body. Which again isn't really a bad thing. We'd rather have low than high. But if it's too low, people could pass out. They can have incidents where you know that's an issue. But typically they'll say if it's just something common to you, it's not like you had normal blood pressure and it dropped low, then you could be bleeding, it could be having, you know, other reasons for it to be low. But if you were always just the person who had, you know, maybe 90 over 60, that's just the way you run, that's okay. But what you might expect to see, because this is so low, is that just the pressure of the right atrium may be felt all the way down to the distal portion. So someone with very low Blood pressure, you might still have an ASD wave, but a very small wave. But what ends up happening is more, instead of phasic, it more like looks like S and D, S and D instead of just phasic. Then that would mean this person has low blood pressure, not necessarily a problem. Or if it has a little A wave, same thing. Would they the S and D be more pressure. blunted? Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it depends on how low the pressure is. If you have more of an A wave that's really low, if it's sort of blended, it's fairly low. If it's phasic, probably you're pushing a little bit. You know, it really 
it's kind of hard to evaluate. So they could have any of the above. So what do I want from you then? I want you to know that in a perfect condition, it should be phasic. Most people will probably fall under one of these categories because not everybody's got this absolute perfect waveform. They're either going to have more of an ASD because they have low pressure, or they're going to have more of a continuous because maybe they're overweight, or maybe what was the other thing was they pregnancy. have pregnancy or another condition that possibly causes it, or maybe it's us. Yep. So first time you see this, you want to go, ooh, am I pushing too hard? Take off a little bit of the pressure and see if it goes away. And see if it goes to more phases. And if, if it's an obese patient, we would just let lateral decubitus? Yeah, just kind of, well, you can do that. We just, just kind of like write it off as, I'm pretty sure it's normal. It's just the patient was overweight. Okay. Just be able to explain when your questions that you know what you're doing and why it looks like this. So you can get three of these. So I might say, what would you know an IBC look like with somebody who was pregnant? And what is the condition that pregnancy causes? And it's a good thing it does this. Oh, uh, the increased hematocrit and viscosity. The hematocrit of your blood increases, which increases the viscosity, which is the thickness of your blood, which is good and bad, right? The bad thing when you have blood that's too thick is you might produce clots. clots. So you are more prone to clots during pregnancy, especially towards the end. But typically, the purpose of that is when you deliver. So as gestation increases, so does hematocrit, and the blood begins to thicken. So by the time you're in your third trimester and you, you uh, deliver, your body loses a lot of blood at that time. We need to be able to clot to stop bleeding. So the body naturally coagulates, and it's at a higher coagulation rate. Basically, is what happens. Your coagulation rate goes up. It just clots faster. So and smart. again, it says it's a good thing. So smart. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. So with increasing gestation, what happens is, like, just say the ASD wave is supposed to be normal. And this is going to, like I said, I told you, when we do the waveforms, we're going to also cover what's in the packet. So a person who's pregnant, say, first trimester, you might see your normal ASD. Maybe second trimester, you lose the A wave. Why? Because that pressure in hepatic veins that was on average about 15 might now be 20. So your 10, pressure gradient of 10, as first trimester five. increases, it goes to 5. Second trimester, it's equal, so you don't have a pressure an A wave. And then by third trimester, it might be like 30, so that blood just continues to go into the heart. And even though the atrium is contracting, none of it goes back because the pressure outside is greater than the pressure of the heart contracting. And then you get a more blended waveform. And it's normal. So first trimester, it's either probably going to be normal, you know, the little A wave, or absent A wave. Second trimester, most likely an absent A wave. And third trimester, pretty much a blended S and D the whole time, and definitely no A wave. So, is it possible to have a tiny, tiny A wave in the second trimester? Sure, yeah. anything's possible. Yeah, everybody's coagulation rate's going to be different. There. But the whole point is, if you see an absent A wave, that's don't normal. don't It'll be necessarily alert. panic. Yeah. Okay. They, they might be pregnant. There might be some other reason for it. So, an absent A wave is just telling us that the pressure systemically in the venous system is getting closer to that 25 pressure when the atrium contracts. And we might want to look for reasons that might, might they might have an absolute A wave. It's really involved. Vascular is a lot more involved. It's more applied physics. You have to understand pressure. Everything in the body with blood is about pressure rates. So this class should be a great introduction to understanding all of how it works, but what you're really lacking is pathology and scanning hands-on. At least you're going to understand what's going on when you see them doing these things. You're going to be like, oh, I know what they're doing. I understand partial gradients. Muscular so, sonographers normally get paid more. Because they do get paid more. Mm -hmm. yeah. They do get paid more. They have to think a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and they have to do a lot more with Doppler. And, and M mode. We do a lot of measurements when we do echoes and, and things like that. So, mm -hmm. so far, so good?
Mm -hmm. yeah. So I told you, we kind of answer everything that's in the lecture as well when we do all of these waveforms. Let me check on my online group. How's the online group doing? If they're sending messages, it's really weird because they don't tell you them. What we were the third distal waveform. I have phasic continuous, and what was the third? Phasic continuous. Oh, ASD. The ASD occurs if they have very low just blood pressure in general. I like that they can see this. I don't know how well they can see, but how do I make my picture the dominant one? Like Emma's is the big one on here. You know what I mean? It goes by activity, so there is good literature. Yeah, because then at least they could see better. It's so small. Yeah, I think you have to put yourself as like a presenter or something like that. Oh. You can use the board. Where are you? I can see a lot better. I'm, I'm down there. Um, you're working your brain so hard. I guess. Morning me thinks I won't. I know how to change it for a presenter. Maybe that will like, see. Um, um, I'm definitely going to get one after school. I'm a moderator. Maybe put the camera at the podium. Oh, no, it definitely doesn't. Yeah, I can't. Keep it um. Oh, my friend's having a rough time this morning. Should be still just like off and on. It's your camera. Oh. Oh. Really, I was about to no. What? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. Oh. Or, or, there you oh. go. Well, oh, oh, that's much better. Okay. Here, can I? Tell me if that's a good. Is the board good? I think it was better before. It was better. Yeah. That's showing this board. Yeah, you want the other board more. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we did the distal IBC. We know that it's what three ways? Oh, spontaneous, phasic. Spontaneous and phasic in the perfect ideal situation, which is hardly ever going to be continuous. If you're pushing too hard, yeah. or the patient is pregnant, yeah. or the, uh, the patient is obese, yeah. and, um, and you said that was because of the fat. It's yeah, it literally has pressure. Okay. The IBC is a low pressure vessel to begin with, so anything putting pressure on it is going to cause it to collapse. Mm -hmm. And then when you dump or something that's pinched off, it's going to have that continuous flow pattern. I think I heard that in chiropractic theories, it could be extrinsic or extrinsic. So oh. this IBC distal, this one you're saying is just phasic, it doesn't look spontaneous? No, it's spontaneous as well. Spontaneous just means that it never stops flowing. Okay, because it flowed this During the duration that the Doppler is on, yeah. there was no breaks or hesitations. Okay, so if I explain this picture to you as a spontaneous and phasic, yeah. I would get full credit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what's the difference between that and continuous? Continuous. The same volume. Yeah. Same velocity. The same the same volume, volume, volume. Volume. This is continuous. This. I know. It might not be even drastic, but when you connect it, pretty much a straight line, 
Here, there's dips when you connect it. Okay. This is phasic. This one's continuous. That's basic and spontaneous? Well, let's do this then. Okay, so they're not spontaneous because you have that void of blood volume. Yeah, so but if it was connected through the entire thing, then it would be spontaneous. spontaneous and okay. 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 okay, this one's just phasic, but it's not steady or spontaneous. Gotcha. This one is continuous and spontaneous. Or steady. That's the other one. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Right, yeah. steady or spontaneous. This one's only phasic. This one spontaneous and spontaneous and phasic. Okay, so I so put the gap on the phasic means it's not spontaneous because I have a void of blood flow. Oh, I still can't see it. Maybe I should use this board. Oh, they can't see that picture either. Well, you know, I'm looking at it and it's just not as clear as this board, which we can use this board, that's fine. Okay, where's my eraser? Right on the floor, right on <laughs> All right, so the next one, what did you guys get for that one? Portal wing, spontaneous and phasic. Pressure is normal, volume is consistent, hepatopetal flow, and low vo velocity. Okay, so portal vein. Now, portal vein is one of those vessels that's going to change its flow pattern, whether it's pre or post parandial. Do you know what that term means? That's after eating. Before and after eating, again, so the portal vein, first of all, what's the job of the portal vein? To supply the level of blood. Supply how much? Oh, is that 70, 70 to 80 percent? 70 to 80 percent of the blood flow to the liver comes from the main portal vein, right? So the portal vein should have what kind of flow? A paddle of pupil. A paddle-ketal flow, right? Because that means it's going towards the liver. the liver. Now, in a pre situation when they're fasting, does it need more or less blood? It needs less. less. Yeah, if you're fasting, less blood. So you're going to have basically what you described in this picture. You're going to have sort of low velocity, about 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury velocity, or not mercury, but um, centimeters per second. Phasic flow. It's going to look like this. Pre-prenda. Okay? Before eating, you're going to have your phasic flow pattern. It's going to be hepatopetal towards the liver. You're going to have that undulating, low velocity, low pressure flow. But about 70 to 80 percent of blood flow being delivered by the portal vein, which is its own separate system, right? Where does the blood from the portal vein come from? From the intestines. From the intestines, exactly. So the intestines is providing all of that blood flow in the portal system. Now, what happens post prandial after you eat? It requires more flow. It requires more blood flow, right? Does an artery have the ability to vasodilate and vasoconstrict a regular artery? Right. Does it have the ability to what? To vasodilate. Yeah. A regular artery. Oh, no, no. This is, um, the vasodilation happens at the cap. It's a microcirculation in the yes. arterioles. Yes. Okay. So this isn't going to dilate. So if you're putting more volume through what's almost like a rigid tube, What's the result going to be if you've got more volume going through? Increased pressure. Increased pressure. What is that going to look like in a vein? Continuous. Continuous. A little bit of higher velocity, more continuous. You might still get a little bit of, I like to uh, phrase it as somewhat 
continuous. That means it might still have a slight undulating pattern, but but the velocity is up a bit, and it looks a lot more continuous than when they're fasting. So it's going to be more continuous. And this one's phasic. Can you guys see better? Yes, good. Sorry about that. I should have thought about that. We're getting better at this. Okay, so it's going to be. Yep, working out the kinks. Pre prandial to post prandial. Basic, not as much volume, going to be more affected by the pressure, the breathing, the heart, all that kind of stuff. Whereas afterwards, you've got more volume. Now, the arterials may be vasodilated in areas, but it doesn't change the main structure of that vein. So it's going to feel more pressure. It's going to look more continuous. Okay. So for the post grindel, it's going to be a higher velocity and higher pressure. Yep. And for pre, it's lower pressure and, and lower velocity phasic flow. Phasic, they're both spontaneous or steady, right? That means it goes on and on and on. But this one's phasic and this one's continuous because there's no break. So the volume is consistent. Starting to get a little bit yes. easier. And I told you tomorrow we'll do portal hypertension. Okay, today we're going to stick with us. All right, what about the splenic vein? A couple of things I want to mention about the splenic vein. Where do you go to find the splenic vein? Say you were going to adopt where the splenic vein is. What's your go to landmarks for the splenic vein? The pancreas. The pancreas. Yeah, if you got your pancreas. And that transverse cousin. Where is your where is your splenic vein gonna show up? Well, yeah, just this is considered posterior, right? So just posterior to the and then of course this part of it, the main portal vein goes behind the head and then back into the liver. All right, here's our liver. So if you were to Doppler the splenic vein, there's one thing that usually shows up a lot with the, the splenic vein as an artifact. I don't know if you guys notice it, see in the picture, what is that artifact that's showing up called? I thought it was clutter, but... Yeah, no, I don't you think it is now. Only because it is. It, it is? Yeah. Yeah. Why would it, what were you thinking? Okay, so the reason we had this discussion last night, the reason we decided it wasn't clutter, was because it didn't have its own, um... No, if it, if it has its own space, it's real. If it shares time, it's not real. It's clutter. Oh, okay. The opposite of what you were thinking. Okay. See how it's sharing time with the real waveform? And is that, okay, so because it's clutter, are you going to increase your wall filter yep. to get rid of the clutter? Okay. Increase the wall filter. But not a lot, right? Because if you do it too much, you're going to start racing. Because, wave. right, veins are very low pressure anyways. So sometimes you just live with the clutter. If it, it looks like you're going to erase half of your waveform, just leave it. Okay. But what do you think is causing it? What's the other anatomy that goes into this picture here? Oh, uh, the aorta and the IVC. So the aorta okay, so we have our IVC. Lays under the, yeah. the head there. Mm -hmm. The aorta's over here. Under the body. What's that? The SMA. Yep. What goes through here? The left or renal vein. Yep. What goes behind here? The right renal artery. Literally touches it almost every time. We have this. Getting back to anatomy class, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think happens if this is a low pressure vessel? The aorta is pulsating. Not the aorta, no, but the, the SMA. SMA is literally pulsating, going boom, boom, the boom, 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 boom. Well, the nutcracker is when these pulsate and and literally pinch like this off. Yeah. yeah. And when they pinch that off, what vessel attaches? This is good review for you guys. The gonadal. Well, the left the gonadal, left and if it's dilated, those little valves, if it's especially a male, but this can happen even females too. A certain extent as well. They become incompetent. It becomes incompetent, and then you end up with what? Varicocele. 
Yep, varicocele is down here in the testicle on the left side because of the nutcracker effect. But what's happening here is every time it pulsates, it's doo -doo -doo -doo, it's pushing into that waveform. So you want to know what's real and what isn't real. This is obviously clutter. It's what we would consider noise on the waveform. We may or may not be able to get rid of that if it's a vein and it's low. And, and again, putting the wall filter up, if it erases this much of your signal, do you think we ought to just live with it? Yes. Yeah. Who wants to see just the little tips of that? You want to see the waveform. We already know it's clutter. It's not a big deal. You know? So the wall filter, honestly, we probably could live with without even having a wall filter. But so some of us that really know, like things clean and nice, what? Do we know if they've got for the radiologist? Or? God, oh, we hope they would know. No. <laughs> Obviously, you have to remember that. When you deleted all of that, to me, I just felt like it looked more like a monophasic waveform. When well, you exactly, that. exactly. But you would, you should know after experience that that's obviously a wall filter that's too high. When there's like literally a void across the bottom, and you're only seeing the top, that's a wall filter issue. Your filter is set too high. You got to bring that wall filter down. Okay. So the rule of thumb is with veins, you want your wall filter low. Arteries, you can put it up to like medium or high. Some systems let you adjust that dial as high as you want or as low as you want. Other systems only give you a um, low, medium, and high option. Mm. It's Again, it's more or less for, not for you, but for the radiologist who maybe wasn't schooled up in ultrasound and they literally trust everything and they say, well, what's that? Because they just don't really know it very well. Hopefully that's not the case. You kind of expect them to know a little bit, maybe not more than you, but a little bit more about waveforms. I mean, but think about it. They have to know every modality. They have to know ultrasound, MR, X-ray, CAT scan. I mean, and look at all the things that you guys are learning just for your modality. Plus, they have to go to medical school and learn everything about the body. So that's like kind of a, a lot. So if they don't specialize in ultrasound, they're trusting you. They're literally asking you, what is it? Is that normal? Is that right? Is that good? Is this pedopedal? Is that pedopugal? What's going on? You are the eyes for the radiologist. So the SMA is what made the clutter. Yeah. Now the hepatic artery, okay, we know is, a, is one of the first branches off the celiac axis. And this is a tough one to Doppler, really tough. The best place to find the hepatic artery is literally in the portal triad, right alongside this sagittal view. You know when you go through the ribs? I know that Ms. Piper has been making you go through the ribs, right, to get that color picture to assess whether or not this is hepatopedal versus hepatofugal flow. Well, if you notice, right alongside it, you're going to see the hepatic arteries. Teeny tiny. I don't know if you see it in the picture. Sometimes I mistake it for the common bio. Well, you know why you won't? Look at the, the picture. Even though this is a black and white picture, you can tell there's color aliasing. Look at that turbulent flow pattern. It's going to have much higher velocity. The bile duct barely moves. The bile duct isn't going to have that, that red aliasing flow. Only an artery will. That's how you can tell the difference between the bile duct well, I thought the bottom fill in. any color at all. Well, it really normally, shouldn't. It okay, shouldn't. So it's really normally, it's um, so slow. Well, then which one is add color, and you'll know the one that doesn't have any color is about that. Yeah, but here's the other. Here's the problem with that. Do you know that nine out of ten times when you're showing me the bile duct and you put the color flow on, this is how you're showing your box. What's the problem with that? We're going 90. 90. You're at ninety anyways. If you're at a really good angle, you might get a trickle, but it's, it should be very, it moves less than six centimeters per second and color can't pick up flow less than six centimeters. So actually having color with that limitation is helpful for differentiating the hepatic artery from the bile duct, but at 90 degrees it's really not because you can have a hepatic artery and not know it. So you said it's best to get it uh, through the pores? We're, we're right here, where you're getting that nice vertical because you're coming in at at least 60 or 30 degrees, our hope is that you're coming in at zero, right? And this is going to run parallel as part of the portal triad. So 
we're really, really picky, and I'm going to be picky with you next month. I'm really picky about your bile ducts. I don't want a little piece. I don't want it this way. I want a nice bile duct with your IVC, your hepatic artery, um, and your portal vein. If you don't have the whole thing, you don't get full credit. You get partial credit. Yeah, so I'm picking say, it up a notch. So you would say for the hepatic artery to come coronally uh, with your portal triad? Oh, yeah. You probably won't be able to get the... the if you can't get it here, and, and it is a challenge no matter what. All of this, abdominal Doppler is a challenge. It's not you get it right away. And even if you get it, you're going to struggle picking up a signal. It's very tough to get a good signal. It takes me several tries and a lot of patience. A lot of patients. So when we normally do the common bile duct, we're oblique, like right underneath the ribs. Yep. Between the ribs. So you're saying, because normally if we do it color for color, we go right between the ribs up here. So you're saying come here and also do the hepatic artery? Well, it runs right alongside the portal vein. We're gonna... Yeah. It's one of the best places to get it, because you know what? The other place you could try, when you get see the celiac axis like this, right? You've got your splenic artery, and you've got your hepatic artery. The seagull. The seagull. Now, it's going to be really hard to get a good angle. You're going to get 90, 90, 90. And if you're lucky enough, you might get flow going away like this. You can see it. And that's okay because you can always hit invert, right? But you expect it to be maybe going away. Or if you doppler it from here, you have a pretty good angle, and you expect it to be on the towards or wherever that positive or negative is. Remember, your box, your spectral display could be inverted at any time. You always got to pay attention to when it's showing up below or above, if that's positive or negative in the way you're sending your beam. This is, this is a go-to, but a lot of times it's very 90 and it's hard to get off of the celiac axis. The best one for the best angle is alongside the portal vein. Okay. It's going to give you the best angle. So. I need water. Is that in a transverse? Uh, this is in a transverse plane. This is in a no bleak. No bleak yeah. And it doesn't matter as long as the vessel is sagittal. So for the hepatic artery, mm -hmm. uh, we wrote that it was pulsatile, triphasic, and mm -hmm. high resistance. It's not triphasic. It's not? Mm -hmm. No. It's not triphasic? It's okay. So No, this is good. This is why I'm going to go over it. It's a low so I see what you're calling, looking at, and thinking maybe that's triphasic. What is, is that? It's, it's clutter again. It's clutter again. Oh my gosh. Clutter again. Yeah. I didn't believe in So that. in this person, there's two things you could do to make that picture look better. One is increase the wall filter. What's the other thing? Lower the Doppler gain. Yeah. You got it. Lower the Doppler gain. Turn up the wall filter. Get rid of that clutter. Because Again, maybe the, the radiologist isn't as schooled as you are in this. They're going to be thrown off by anything that they're not aware of, honestly. You hope they know stuff, but they don't. So we want to make the pictures as pretty as possible for them. So this is a low-resistant, biphasic flow pattern, which is very normal for the hepatic artery. And what percentage of flow comes from the hepatic artery to the liver? 30 to 20. Yeah, probably about 20%. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Getting easier? Mm -hmm. Aorta. Yeah, I should have, I should have pressed one. <laughs> well, that's why we're doing this. That's why I like to go over this. Like I said, it covers everything you need in the packet. So, so is it not different enough to be pulsatile? Should it be? No, it's pulsatile. It is. It's pulsatile. Yep, sorry. My bad. Oh, pulsatile is included too. Yeah. We weren't sure Anything that's an one. artery is also pulsatile. Oh, always? I mean, yeah. there's like a problem. Oh, yeah, right? <laughs> no, even if there's a problem, <laughs> even if it's monophasic, it's still pulsatile. Okay. Well, because it says major, so I don't know, like, what, you know, that's kind of the thing. Yeah, well, when it gets diseased, it's not as major, but it's still pulsatile. Okay. Yeah, if it's an artery, it, it's pulsatile. Good. So we're writing that for every single artery. We're going to write <laughs> yeah. aorta. Yeah, every yeah. single artery is pulsatile. So what's the proximal aorta? Is pulsatile? I said triphasic. Why? 
Not well, necessarily it, wrong in this case. Though. Because it has a reversal flow, and it also looks like it has the snapback. Yeah. What do you say? Um, on this particular person, it is definitely a little triphasic, but mm -hmm. it can be just biphasic. So for the proximal aorta, it could look like one of two things. And they're both normal, okay? And I'll tell you why. Aortic yeah. prox is biphasic, right? Huh? Aortic prox, is it still triphasic or biphasic? It could be either or. Mm -hmm. In the picture, it looks a little tri. Are you a part-time artist? Yeah, isn't this wonderful? Do you like my, <laughs> you're making fun of my drawings? No, I tried to, you should see my liver. I just tried to draw your liver. It's a joke. Oh, okay. <laughs> now I don't feel so bad. I actually thought it was pretty bad. I was like, so, <laughs> for Doppler in the proximal aorta, let's just, let's just do this for kicks and giggles. Here's my display. Oh, no. If this is the proximal aorta, and I have a celiac in the SMA that's going to my intestines, my liver, or my spleen, right? Because all those branches coming off the stomach, they need more blood than the legs need, right? So you would expect this to be lower resistant than this. If the patient is fasting, there's a possibility there might be a little bit of reversal on that proximal, just like that picture is. Otherwise, if they've eaten a little bit, or maybe it was even a few hours, but they're still digesting, they're still needing more blood, it might just be more like this. What does this part of the waveform tell us? Isn't that the snapback? Or is no, that it's the, not the, the snapback. Oh, it's the... Um, not the elasticity? No. Not the elasticity, it's the state of the arterial's vasodilation or vasoconstriction. The more diastole you hear, you have here, what if the aorta looks like this versus this versus this? This one's getting a lot more blood. Maybe they ate. That's normal, right? But if they're fasting and it looks really almost low instead of moderate, Maybe they're not getting enough blood to their intestines while they're resting. Maybe something's going on. They're getting some ischemic event going on. So it should be in the average person who comes in for, if they're coming in specifically for an aortic Doppler, they're going to be fasting. So you should see a very, what I would call is a high moderate, because it's pretty much moderate with a little bit of reversal. That's a high moderate instead of a low moderate. If they've eaten, they have more of a low moderate. But moderate by definition is rapid acceleration, sharp peak, rapid to gradual deceleration, and then forward flow throughout the diastolic period. When it's a high moderate, the arterioles are more pinched off. This one's a little bit bigger, and this arterial root is a lot bigger. And we're talking about, again, the individual little arterioles vasodilating. I I get that, but like for the test we're going to have, would we call something like this high resistance or high moderate? Whatever it looks like to you. It looks like a kind of a high moderate, or you could say, uh, since you know it's supposed to be more in the moderate, I would go with the high moderate. And what makes it? Because the distal, on the other hand, oh, I was going to draw this. Okay, if the flow is going like this, and we're sampling like this, we're going to get the majority of the signal on this side. This one's going to be and should be triphasic, a lot of reversal, because the arterials are literally closed if they're not exercising. But if we're sampling this way, what's this going to look like? Upside down of this triphasic flow pattern, right? Is it normal? Yes, because the majority of the blood's going away, then it comes back, then it goes forward again. So if you're sampling from this perspective because it's the easiest way to get the distal aorta, which a lot of times it is, you might have to flip 
your display so that you can see it present right side up if you want or gotcha. let's see. um what makes what makes this one here that we're looking at more moderate or more high i mean fasting when you when you call this high moderate what makes it look well high when i resist something highly resist i'm not allowing it it's not allowing blood to move forward it's reversing a teeny tiny bit it's resisting the flow. But when the arterials say, come on in, there's no resistance. All this flow moves easily in diastole. Remember, in diastole, the heart isn't beating. Well, it's not. It's, be, it's rest in the resting phase. It's not like in the squeezing phase. So it's literally not in the pushing of blood in there. So it's just naturally flowing in there very easily because the arterial bed is so open. Okay, so the first waveform that you drew was a fasting patient. Yep. This, so that's a low resistance. The middle one? No, no. It's a high moderate. So that's, okay. The reversal oh, is resistance. It's moderate because it fits the definition, rapid upstroke, sharp peak, rapid deceleration, tiny bit of reversal, or, or continuous flow. So this could be high, or I like to call it a high moderate, because it's almost closer to moderate then it is high because high really has a lot of reversal and then some snapback. This has a teeny tiny bit of reversal due to the fact that they're completely fasting, probably been fasting for a while. Because most of the time when you look at the aorta in an average person, even if they're fasting, sometimes they didn't complete digesting yet. So you're going to see what looks like a truly moderate. And then after they eat, you get a lower moderate than you did before. So with the high moderate, sometimes you'll get a slight reversal? Yeah, just a little bit. Even on the external, you'll get that on some people. And then you'll have that forward flow. Would you call it continuous forward flow? Yeah. In diastole. In diastole, yeah. There should always be flow in diastole. See, what's really different, why I try to stay away from calling it high, because in the diastolic period here, where it reverses so much, those arterials are completely pinched off. If you see something like this way up here, we have a problem. A teeny tiny bit is fasting. But if it's completely reversing in the prox, in the prox, there's something going on with the digestive system here that's not letting it. So the, the distal aorta has a higher resistance. Yeah, because there's no blood going to the legs or muscles when they're not being used. And it's always triphasic. Triphasic, high resistance. Rapid up stroke, sharp peak, rapid deceleration, lots of reversal, and then a snapback. So this isn't even like continuous forward flow. That's snapback flow. Diastolic, all of this would be reversed if the vessel didn't snap back. Whereas here, we need more blood. We need blood to go here. The only thing that can cause this is some serious case of plaque buildup in the artery blocking flow to the intestines. And that person would be very, very symptomatic. If you have this kind of flow proximal, you have some serious problems. Okay. It probably would actually end up being more monophasic. That would be severe ischemic. But that person's going to come in with excruciating pain. Is it like mesenteric ischemia? Did you read through the thing, the, the PowerPoint? When you get to mesenteric ischemia, that's a condition where there's, there's either acute or chronic. If it's acute, a embolic event broke off and lodged either here or here, causing extreme pain because they just lost blood flow to their entire intestines. If it was gradually building up the plaque, but there's still a little bit of blood flowing through there, it's going to gradually, their condition, get worse and worse. Every time they eat, they're like, oh my god, it hurts, because you need more blood flow when you eat. And if they're already completely vasodilated, but plaque has built up so bad that you're trying to pump five times more blood flow for this little tiny narrow segment, they're going to be kind of keeled over in pain, like, oh, God, every time I eat, it might, I'm just in excruciating pain, abdominal pain. Jesus. They'll end up going to the emergency room for that. And luckily, I say luckily, because this is hard to really diagnose with ultrasound unless you, you're good at it, unless you've been scanning and you really get what you have to do. 
you have to dot point us at zero. You have to be able to see the plaque, understand what's going on, and and make a good call. Usually they'll send them to CT if they really think it's it's mesenteric ischemia because that's a life-threatening condition. Yeah. If you lose flow through here, all your intestines stop getting flow. That's 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 painful and life-threatening. But both the aorta prox and distal prox, they're both high velocities, right? Yeah, they're high velocities. Because the, the peak velocity, if you measure this, is probably about 100. You know, the peak one so was pretty fairly high, 120, something like that. Everybody's a little bit different, but something to that extent. Okay. So far, so good? Let's see if our at-home listeners are good. You guys good? Okay, good. Yep. Awesome. Ah, there we go. Even better. We're working on it. What time do we have here? We're going to go on the lab to 12? Well, there's only four of you, so we will get in there. Let's just finish up. Yeah, so the renal artery is fairly easy. Low velocity, right? Pulsatile. Biphasic. Everybody get that one? You said one of them I didn't have. Biphasic, pulsatile, and low resistance. And low resistance. Low resistance. I don't know. You said something that I didn't Low resistance. Low resistance. Is it all the time? Biphasic. Well, the velocity might be low, but I didn't really mean to say that. I meant to say low resistance. Because what's the definition? What if I said what's the definition of low resistance? You'd be able to say it's a rapid acceleration, mm -hmm. broad peak. systolic peak, gradual deceleration, and then continued forward flow throughout the diastolic period. Just continues on. It's letting in so much blood all the time. They're so vasodilated that even systole is. No effort at all. It just flows right in. Don't ask us to do Friday. Well, you might. <laughs> Friday is going to be, if you study this, all waveforms and then conditions that might change them slightly, pre and post Brandel, anything, you should do great because I'm going to ask you all about waveforms and conditions. All about that packet, all about this. Um, no, okay, never mind. And you said for low resistance, it can have a rapid to gradual deceleration, right? I think that's yeah, but it, that moderate's more rapid to gradual. This to one's low gradual. Is gradual. Yeah. What about the celiac? Low to moderate resistance, biphasic? Yes, good. Low, moderate. Why is she saying low moderate? What about it makes it a low moderate versus the high moderate of the proximal aorta? It's moderate because it has somewhat of a sharp peak, right? Well, yeah, that's true. But, but the, the question was, what makes this a low moderate versus the aorta that was the high moderate? How is this gradual, a high moderate? The gradual, um, Deceleration. In some of it's not really that. It's it's all this is this is all diastole. This is deceleration. It's rapid just as this is. Okay. But you have more diastolic flow than you do this one. The more diastolic flow, the more vasodilated the arterial bed is versus this one. This is more pinched off. This is more dilated. The diastolic so you have two technically. If I said, what's this waveform? And you only had one word to tell me what it is, you'd say moderate. If you only had one word to explain this, you'd say moderate. If you had, you know, if you had to pick between high, low, you know, or moderate, it's moderate. But if you had to compare them, whenever doing a comparison, you would call this one the high, this one the low, because you're comparing two moderates. Does that make sense? How do I know? 
It depends on the diastolic part. This one means the arterial bed is very vasodilated, hence the amount of diastolic flow moving in without resistance. There's lots of diastolic flow. This one's not moving in. Not a lot of diastolic flow is going in because it's pinched off more. So when you do a comparison, and I like to just kind of make it so that you remember, instead of just calling one high and one low, because that's confusing, I call this one the low moderate and this one the high moderate. It's just more exact, because you're technically looking at two moderate waveforms, but you're comparing them. High moderate, not a lot of flow going in. Low moderate, lots of flow going in, less resistance. The high and the low is about the resistance, not about the high amount of flow or the low amount of flow. It's about the resistance. If you're resisting, you're strongly resisting, that's a high resistance. If you're not resisting, that means you're allowing it to happen. Thank you for saying that because that just solidified it for me. Yeah. That was so confusing because I'm looking at how it's not even coming off the baseline and we're calling that high. <laughs> no. High resistance. I'm not allowing you to come into the room. I'm not allowing it. There's no flow being allowed if, if into you, that arterial bed because it's pinched off. If you look at the, the diastole, I mean, yeah. you think of when vasodilate, it opens up. and then This opens up, yeah. which allows it in. And when it's contracting, it's closed. Yeah. But you've got to remember, this is a graph. And this is what I was drawing for you earlier. This, here we go. Here's a, here's a vessel. And we have all different speed red blood cells. Here's 100. This one's going 90. This one over here is maybe 90. This one's 80. You know, it starts to make that parabolic thing. Some of them are 50. Some are 60. So when you have a gate, let's say we put this gate right along the wall, and we have 40 and 50 velocities. On our display, what you're getting is flow that's traveling at 40 or 50. And the more shaded in means the more red blood cells are being graphed on here. So this is literally a graph recording flow that's moving through the gate. If there isn't a whole lot on there, there isn't a whole lot going there. If there's a whole lot being shaded on there, there's more red blood cells going in. So the more diastolic you have on the graph, now, of course, if we make a bigger gate, we're going to have more flow, but it's going to look more like this, just more shaded. It's not going to change how much shows up in the diastolic period. That's determined by the arterial bed. The gate just determines how much shading is going to occur. If we put this gate only in the center where it's 100, the only difference from the wide open gate to the very narrow gate would be this. Systolic and diastolic is the same. There'd be less shading because you're only recording the very fast ones that go through that gate. Okay, so does that help a little bit? That's why most of your abdominal Doppler vessels are all shaded in because the vessels are tiny in comparison to the size of the gate. So we're picking up everything so the whole thing shaded in with abdominal vessels. We already talked about pre and post Brando. So for Doppler and the SMA, look at these two waveforms, guys. There's very little difference. They're both moderate, right? Mm -hmm. So based on what we just said, what's the major difference here? Oh, the diastolic. There's more diastolic in the post Brando. Look at it. When you measure it, and you're going to get quantitative values in the lecture. It says that pre prandial is usually less than 40, right? But post prandial it almost doubles. You're getting double the velocity because you're getting double the volume in there. They've opened up those arterials. So say that one more time. pre prandial you have less velocity. post prandial you have more diastolic. You can visually see it, and when you go to measure it, it literally doubles that velocity because you're putting just twice as much flow in there. But are they both? Are they both? They're both moderate, but I would label the first one high, high moderate, moderate and the second one low moderate. You got it. Okay. 
Just like what we explained up here. How about, are you looking for like what type of velocity they have? Um, you know, more is okay. As long as it's not wrong, more is better. It won't hurt you. It's almost better to put more just so you don't miss something in case I was looking for it. But if you were to use all the words that could describe it, it would be pulsatile, right? It would be biphasic, moderate resistant, or high moderate or low moderate to be very, very specific. Um, if you want to say high velocity, fine, you're not wrong. It is a pretty high velocity. But it would be a higher velocity in the... In the post now, because more flow is going in and it doesn't vasodilate in an actual artery. That's why it speeds up. You got more, five times more blood volume going through there when needed, but yet it's not opening up. The arterial bed opens up, but not the artery. So it goes through there faster. More flow crammed through there faster is the only way to get that volume through because the heartbeat goes up as well. When flow demands increase. Now, the only one that I want to mention here is the last one. There's no picture, but the splenic artery. Now, if you were to draw it, and go ahead, you guys can draw this at home too. Draw what you think the splenic artery might look like. Oh, you guys did draw. Oh, you had it on there. You had one. You had one. Uh, <laughs> See, one of the ones I think if you printed it off there, it might have had that on there. So it should be a low resistance. Now, this is what they say on the registry, but it's kind of, kind of silly. They, they say it's always turbulent. But you know what's really sad about that question? The splenic artery comes off the celiac axis. I'm only going to tell you this because it's on the registry for sure. You have the hepatic artery, and then you have the splenic artery. And it's usually long and tortuous to get to the spleen. So, when they ask you what kind of flow it has, for some crazy reason, they always want you to answer that it's turbulent. Turbulent because it's tortuous. But you know what? You wouldn't be able to assess that anyways. Why not? Because your gait is not... I mean, it's you've your gait. This. How can you even... It's still going to look like this no matter what shade it in because yeah. your gait's small. So I don't know why it's always on the registry review books. Everything I've ever seen, they want you to know it's turbulent and tortuous. So just make a little side note in the registry. They're looking for turbulent and tortuous. But technically, it's low resistant. And that's really the only thing you can assess accurately. Because you, there's no way you can get a gate size small enough to be able to see window filling. It's already going to have window filling. So I don't know why that's such a very heavily tested registered question. But I tell you that now so you're prepared for it. Now, if they ask you, you know, the sweat artery has low resistant, turbulent, they give you multiple things, I'd still pick low resistant. You know why? Because that's really the most diagnostic thing that you can tell with your assessment. If they give you a bunch of answers that you're like, hmm, I'm not sure what any of those are right, Go with the turbulent. And is it biphasic? It's biphasic. Is low to moderate resistance mm -hmm. incorrect? Because um, oh. it's not incorrect. It's just that some people might have that, but most of the time it's low. Okay, so I'm gonna put. I would time. stick with low unless you look at a waveform that looks more like a low moderate. Okay. And what would be the major difference then to a low moderate? This deceleration part, okay. yeah, from low to low moderate would be this deceleration would be rapid, where here it's gradual. Okay. So most people will have this. Some people will have this, and it's still okay. So when it's just a gradual, just completely it's, gradual, it's, you, your peak is broad. Also. Yeah. So your peak is broad, and then it's. Uh, just, it's not directly going. Right. It's, it's, it's gradual. Gradual. Then Deceleration. It's slow. Then it's slow. Okay. That's why it's good to know the definitions. And I might ask you the definitions. Define it. If you, if I said define low resistance, you would say rapid acceleration, because they're measuring the time it goes from here to here, which is right so here. So artery low moderate. 
or you're looking for no, low. Just low. Just low. Just low, but if someone's just low motor, it's not wrong. It's just what theirs is. So if I asked you to define low resistant, you would say rapid acceleration. You'd say broad yeah. peak. You'd say gradual deceleration. Look at how long the deceleration period is compared to the acceleration period. It takes a lot more time to decelerate. And then flow throughout the diastolic period. But in here, the, the peak looks sharp. sharp. Again, and that person it could be. Everybody's body is unique to them and what's going on with their body. So if the, the peak was a kind of sharp, that's when you would you say, could say the that low, it's a low moderate. Low I wouldn't okay. mark you wrong okay. if it was accurate. Okay. If that's what it looked like to you, and I could look at it and you could justify it because it has a sharp peak and a fairly rapid deceleration, then I'd say okay. But if it doesn't have a lot of the components that fit that definition, then, it, then you can't use it. Gotcha. And like everybody's body, there's what's normal, average, and then there's a couple of exceptions to that average depends on that person. So tomorrow we will discuss portal hypertension and any other questions you guys have from the packet. Okay. You guys can go in the lab and try to, you know, try to get one slide done. Again, you know, it might be best that you start with the internal and external because that's what takes the most time and work backwards. Either way, it's in order. You can work backwards, I'm okay with that. But that's probably where you want to continue to practice. Every time we get a little bit short for time, you end up not doing the internal and external, so start there. The rest are going to be fairly easy. And those of you at home, if you have any questions, now is the time to ask. Otherwise, you may leave. All good. Can I get those? Thanks for Mark. Okay. He said he wants to meet me at the gas station so he can put